Hello, I'm Rob Cardona from World Racing, and today I'm with my teammate and our engine builder, Gary Kubo, and we're at our race engine machine shop where basically all the magic happens. We've done all our R&D for our four cylinder power plants from this facility, and now we've got a package that we make upwards of over a thousand horsepower with, and we've ran them in our time attack cars, we've built our 2,000 plus horsepower drag race engines from this facility, and today Gary Kubo and I are gonna go through the basic build of one of these engines. We're gonna go through some of the really high quality components that we use to make these power plants do the things that they can do, and we're gonna go through it from the bottom up. The key to a successful engine build starts with a really good foundation. And the use of really high quality parts. Here I'll show you one of our JE pistons that's going into this engine assembly, and one of our prototype BC rods. And now Gary will explain to us a little bit about how these parts come together inside the block. We're gonna start off with the pistons. Uh, these are high quality pistons from JE. When we first get them, after they're ordered, we'd like to inspect them visually and to make sure that uh, we're actually getting what we ordered. Uh, it consists of a wrist pin, a retaining wire lock, and a high quality set of rings. First off, we're gonna measure the cylinder bores. Uh, this block has already been bored and honed, but we wanna make sure that the clearances are gonna be correct. So I'm using here is a dial bore gauge. First, we're gonna stick in the dial bore gauge. Dial bore gauge is already preset to the bore size we're trying to obtain. So we're pretty close, we're within a tenth. You wanna measure both sides, and you wanna measure in a couple points in the block. Now that we got the measurements, uh, we know this is the bore size we're trying to achieve. 3563. Well, the dial bore gauge was set at 3563. When the needle's at zero, we're dead on the money. So the bore is machined exactly where it needs to be. Now we're gonna measure the piston. The reason why we're doing this is because there's a critical measurement called the piston of wall clearance. That's the operating clearance that the piston needs to be at in order for proper operation. JE always sends a spec sheet inside the box of pistons you order. There's a specific important clearance information. This particular engine is set at three and a half thousandths, 0 0.0035. We gotta measure the piston diameter half an inch above from the tip of the skirt to determine the piston wall clearance. We're gonna use this external mic to determine that measurement. Now that we measured the cylinder bore diameter size, and we measured the diameter of the piston according to JE's specifications, these are the measurements. We're gonna subtract the difference to see if we can obtain the piston wall clearance. Okay, let's enter the measured bore size. And now we're gonna subtract it from the actual piston size. We come up with three and a half thousandths, dead on the money. All right, time to hang the rod and piston assembly together. First, we're gonna start off, again, uh, as you saw earlier in the video, these wire locks. We're gonna start installing them on one side. Get a screwdriver. Gently walk the pin inside. Okay, we got the first wire lock on. What I like to do is I like to use just a, a wrist pin that I say for assembly. Just make sure this guy is in there. No, this way it doesn't pop out. Next, we're gonna move on to hanging the actual rod to the piston. First, we gotta add a little bit of assembly lube on the pin bores. Just a little bit, not too much is necessary. You could also make sure to put some assembly lube on the connecting rod bushing. Just a little bit's enough. Now we're gonna actually hang the piston to the rod. Now one thing that's uh, pretty critical is uh, get familiar with what side the valve reliefs are on the piston. Obviously the bigger side on most engines is the intake side, the smaller side is the exhaust side. Uh, most engines, there's what's called a bearing tang. A lot of the engines, the bearing tang alignment with a particular side of the valve relief is very critical. On this particular Toyota engine, the, the valve reliefs should face the exhaust valve relief on the piston. 
So we're gonna start off by putting this wrist pin in the piston. Make sure it uh, obviously goes in without any burrs, smooth. Again, we're identifying the exhaust valve relief, the bearing tang. Rotate it so it's on the right side. And then next, press the wrist pin assembly onto the piston. I, before you put the other wire lock in, I would suggest double checking one more time. Exhaust, bearing tan exhaust. Now that we've determined that's to be accurate, we could put the final wire lock onto the piston. Okay, once again, I got this wrist pin that I use just for a tool for assembly purposes. Got the wire locks in, just kind of go in there and make sure that they're seated. If you hear any snapping, that means the wire lock was never seated to begin with. So this is a good insurance. Now we got a piston rod hung. Everything looks good. Rod has a good amount of clearance, not too much. Everything looks good. We're gonna to move to the next procedure, which is installing the rings. These are uh, rings that actually come with the piston set that we ordered from JE. Very high quality rings. Uh, primarily made for like high boost, turbocharged, supercharged applications. Uh, we're going to start with uh, identifying which way the rings go and which rings go in which grooves. Very critical because some rings are the same diameter, some rings are the same width. You don't want to put the wrong ring on the wrong groove. <laughs> You're going to have an oil pump. So um, uh, we're going to start off. First open up the box. Okay. Obviously we have what's called the top ring. This is the compression ring as they call it. Now this is called the second ring or the scraper. Now the third ring is called the oil control ring. It's a three piece deal. This is called what's called the expander. And these are the rails that actually hold this expander ring into the third groove. We're gonna start off with the top ring. Unless specified, most manufacturers have either a manufacturer mark, symbol, number, dot, signifying that this is the top direction of the ring, meaning it should face the crown of the piston. Not this way, this way. This will ensure the proper function of this top compression ring. Second ring refers to the second groove. It's in between the first and the third, often called a scraper. Again, there's a manufacturer mark, symbol, dot. Depends on the manufacturer. Some people have numbers, some people have dots. This always needs to face upwards, unless specified. Now we're moving on to the final set of rings, which is called the oil control ring. They're typically located, or always located on the third groove, uh, which is typically the widest groove of the two above. This ring controls the amount of oil that is sustain on the cylinder for lubrication prop, uh, pro, uh, purposes and or to uh, remove back into the crankcase. Um, there's really no which way to put the expander unless it's specified, but it's installed in the piston and held in by these two expanders. They're both the same. One goes above the expander One goes below. Now that we've covered which rings go in which grooves and what they actually do and how to identify them, um, we're gonna go over what's called uh, checking the ring end gap. We're gonna start off with the oil control ring because that's usually the step. You start off at the bottom and kind of work your way up so all the rings fit. Out of the three rings on the oil control, this is called the expander. Uh, there's really no end gap clearance to this, but uh, it's a good idea to check it in the cylinder bore just to make sure that it's not like this or you know a big old gap. It should usually be butted together or slightly over depending if it's a high tension oil control ring or a standard. Now we're going to go over to the cylinder block, place it in there and just kind of 
check it out. Just make sure we're in the right uh, zone before we start putting these things on. Okay, now we're gonna place the expander inside the cylinder. Kind of eyeball it. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, it's slightly overlapped over the very edge, which is normal. This is a high tension oil control ring. So we're good with this. Now we're gonna check the end gaps for the rails that hold this expander into the oil control ring. It. Now, JE recommends a minimum clearance of 15 thousandths. 15 thousandths feeler gauge fits. We're good to go. Now, let's check the end gaps of the second ring. We're asking for a 25 thousandths end gap. Okay, we're good. Now we're gonna check the top ring, which is the compression ring. All right, we're good. All the end gaps measured. Now we can start putting the rings onto the actual piston and assemble the piston onto the block. All right, we're just about done putting the rings on. This is the top ring. I like to always use a Commander tool so we don't twist the rings. Typically on the end gaps, JE suggests clocking them 180 apart so the top ring is here, as you can see by the intake valve relief. I like to set the exhaust, um, I like to set the end gap on the second ring right by the exhaust. We're on the alignment marks, the symbols on the manufacturer on the top, so the rings all are installed properly. Now we're going to put it into the block. We're going to take the rod cap off. Just a dab of assembly lube on the bearing. That should be enough. This is the installer for the piston and ring assembly. Before you put it in there, just make sure, just one more time, just make sure the end gaps are clocked correctly. Right, now we're ready to fire this piston in this hole right here. Um, one thing that's very important is uh, making sure which side is the exhaust side and the intake side. Obviously you see these valve reliefs cut on this piston. Now the direction this is installed has to be in the same relation. If not, uh, you're going to have a valve relief that's too small for the intake valve and one in the exhaust valve that's way too big. Now make sure that the uh, cylinder that you're putting in the piston is at bottom dead center. Carefully put the piston into the cylinder. Kind of eyeball it and make sure it's straight with the center line of the crank. Hold the compressor down. Gently. We're in. Now we're going to flip the block over. Just make sure now, uh, once the block's flipped over, the rod is properly aligned with the crank journal, which it appears to be. Now we're gonna put the rod cap on and finish the assembly. Now we're gonna put a little bit of assembly lube on the rod cap to make sure the bearing has some oil during assembly. Um, again, the bearing tang, the bearing tang on the cap must align. So make sure that they're being assembled together correctly. Now we're gonna put a little bit of rod bolt lube to whatever the manufacturer of the rod specifies. Uh, for this case, for BC, they wanted us to use gear oil. I'm gonna tighten up the cap. Now we're ready to torque the rod bolts uh, for the final assembly. I like to use this feeler gauge on the side of the rod during the torquing, just to make sure that the rod doesn't clock and deform the bearing. Now make sure that uh, you torque the rod bolts properly with the proper lube to specify torque. 
make one swooping motion, no jerking, no torquing 10 times. Now we're complete with assembly. We can move on to do the other cylinders. Now that Gary's got all the JE pistons installed into the block, let's go on to the more crucial part of this build, which is gonna be the cylinder head and how we install the BC cams and do all the machine work before installing the valve train. Now we're over here at the cylinder head bench and I'm with Marv Grogan, who's gonna help me explain some of the procedures that it takes to actually install some of these BC valve train components and their cams, because this is engine blueprinting. There's no such thing as a true drop-in cam because every cylinder head's gonna have some variance between another and all the parts are gonna have a small variance between each other. So it's very important that you double, double and triple check some of these procedures before just dropping the parts in. The first thing that we always check is to make sure the cams are going to go around in the cylinder heads. Um, you need to visually inspect the cylinder head to make sure that there's no scoring or galling from the old camshafts. Maybe it had a lack of oil or something like that. If it does, the head needs to come off and it needs to go to a reputable machine shop. Um, but what you can do, if there's no gall galling or scoring or anything like that, you can just put the camshaft in, put a little bit of lube on it, and just make sure it's going to go around. If the head is warped or it's got some problems, the camshaft won't go around. And then you can put the caps on and tighten them down and still make sure it goes around. If the cam goes around, then you're good to go there. If you're not going to remove the valves or anything like that, then you can pull the lifters out, keep them all in order, and make sure the cams go around that way. Now that we've checked to make sure the camshafts are going to go around, we install all the lifters and we number them, intake and exhaust, one through eight on both sides, and we put them in. At this point in time, there are no valves in the cylinder head because we're gonna set the lash. So then we put the camshaft in, put on all the cam caps, and we'll torque them to the proper specification. Now I'm going to install the valves and there are no springs or retainers or anything on them at this point in time and what we're going to do is set the valve lash by tipping the top of the valve. We will set the valves at the specs that Brian Crower recommends and we'll check that with a feeler gauge and what we do is go in there between and for what he calls out we'll set the valves. Usually they're too tight so what we do is we measure it and if the feeler gauge doesn't go in, we go ahead and we pull the valve back out and then we take it over to the valve grinder and we tip it. We take the material off of this end. Now we're going to tip the valve in the machine over here. And this is in increments of a thousandths and what we'll do is we need it to grind off like three thousandths and we'll just turn it in until we remove a little bit, and then we'll go back over and check it. Then after we've set the lash on all the valves, tipped all the valves, got our correct lash, then we pull the whole cylinder head back apart again, and then we're going to go ahead and put our valves back in and set our installed heights, make sure we don't have a coil bind problem with our springs, make sure we have the proper pressures, and get everything set. Now we're going to check the installed height, which we're going to put a retainer on along with the keepers, and then we're going to measure the distance from the bottom of the retainer to the spring seat on the cylinder head. And that way we're going to make sure we have enough spring pressure on the head and we're going to make sure that we do not have a coil bind problem. 
If the spring coil binds or something like that, it'll knock the lobes right off the camshaft. If we don't have enough spring pressure, it won't close the cam properly. Now that we've seen Gary assemble the short block, and we've seen the attention to detail that Mark puts into each one of the cylinder heads, the last key component to one of these engine builds is our descendant billet aluminum intake manifold. This manifold is manufactured by Golden Eagle, and they CNC the flange, the O-ring seal, the runners, and every component of this manifold. And we've ran this and tested it over 50 pounds of boost with absolutely no failures whatsoever. Now that you've seen the basic buildup of one of our world racing engines, we'd like to thank JE Pistons, Brian Crower, and Golden Eagle Manufacturing for all of their continuous support throughout the years. If you have any questions about the procedures that you've seen us go through, or if you'd like to reach out to us and order one of these engines, please feel free to do so by calling us at the shop or reaching out to us on the web. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time.